Hello everyone, this is Nitpicky Nerd, and I want to review the third episode of Star Trek Picard, which I thought was much better than episode 2, but not as good as episode 1. And there are a lot of stupid moments as I mentioned, which I will complain about, but first I want to go over the things I actually liked, and uh, I think I did like some of the new characters, even though they're kind of stereotypically, it's kind of not very original to do what they're doing, but it's still kind of fun even though it's not really the Star Trek style and all of that, and I complained a lot about uh, the Star Trek Utopia being destroyed and turned into a dystopia, Starfleet being the bad guys now and all of that, which I still have a problem with, but what they're doing with these characters is the same kind of stuff that they tried to do with Voyager, but then kind of forgot about it, and on Deep Space Nine they had kind of more interesting characters, much more shady and much more uh, strange, and because they were aliens that was the excuse why it's uh, not so typical of a human, here a lot of these characters are humans, but they're kind of with problems, and uh, this is something I predicted, I think, uh, from uh, ages ago, before any rumors, before any leaks came out, I kind of made a prediction video about this show, and I think I kind of nailed it. If you look up any of my older videos talking about what I think they will do with the Picard show, I predicted a lot of this stuff, but if it's done well, maybe it will be worth it, maybe it will be good. So they show us the character of Rafi, and she seems to be kind of a, a Sarah Connor type. She kind of dresses like her, she has a tank top, she has kind of military hat, and she's smoking, she's drinking, and she's muscular, and she's kind of a tough woman who has some kind of dark past, and she's messed up, and she's addicted to stuff, and she's paranoid, and seeing conspiracies, a little bit crazy, all of that. And so that's obviously similar to the Sarah Connor which I always liked, and so part of me does kind of like that, even though I know it's kind of uh, not very original, but I still think it was uh, done well. So I kind of like, I was surprised to actually like that character. And also I always say that a character with weaknesses, with defects, with problems is an interesting character, because if they actually do something with it later, again, it depends on what they will do, but if they do it right, this might be a very nice uh, character arc. If Picard helps her to recover from her addiction uh, somehow, if uh, all this adventure will somehow improve her life in the end. And so a lot of these characters, if they do something interesting with them and develop them properly, they might be very good. It all depends on the continuation. That's why I can't really judge it yet. They also introduce this new pilot, which is obviously kind of that mercenary type. And he has tattoos, and he smokes, and he uh, doesn't care about the injuries, and so he's a tough guy, he has PTSD, he cannot sleep at night. And I think the actor was great, and uh, one of the things that shows me why he's such a good actor is uh, because they had that other character of the EMH, a hologram who looks exactly like him, and yet acts completely different, like a different person, and that shows that the actor is indeed a very good actor because he basically plays two people who are completely different in their personality and their uh, body language and everything and all those scenes of them talking it's almost like he's being lectured to by his uh, conscious and so it's like uh, someone seeing you know an angel on uh, the shoulder and that kind of stuff and also they showed some more of that scientist lady and it's obvious now that she's kind of a uh, super nerdy and timid and shy and all of that and so that's kind of like Tilly in Discovery only maybe better because Tilly was kind of inconsistent like she was nerdy one second, the next uh, she was uh, a party animal, she was very strange character because she kept changing personality wise, suddenly she's a tough uh, warrior, the next uh, second she's a nerdy shy woman, and so it didn't make sense here, it's kind of consistent for now, so she's a scientist, and so it fits for her to be so nerdy, and so she's shy, and she's insecure, and all of that, so that might be interesting. And the two Romulans who live with Picard, uh, I kind of begin to like them because at first I was uh, thinking what's the point of these characters in this episode, I kind of began to like them, but uh, they will not go on the mission with Picard. And so I'm thinking, so what was the whole point of setting them up if they will not be in the rest of the show? Maybe they will be doing something on Earth, I guess. But I was just beginning to like them and uh, they had some uh, funny moments, you know, the woman constantly berating the man which is not surprising in these uh, shows, uh, they constantly do that for some reason. Both in Discovery and in Picard, they constantly have to show scenes of a woman being more powerful or smarter or stronger than a man. So we have these two Romulans and the woman is clearly much smarter and more able than the man who is shown to be kind of an idiot and she keeps uh, berating him for it and it is kind of funny. So I have to admit I kind of enjoy some of these uh, interactions between them because simply because it's comedy, it's funny. 
And about this whole issue of uh, showing that women are more powerful than men, you know, individually each of those instances would have been fine, but only when you look at the overall amount of how many times they do that, then you kind of realize, okay, there's some kind of agenda here. They're trying to push this message that women can be tougher than men. And even with the villains, they have those two Romulans on the Borg cube, and uh, we have that uh, Spork guy. And whenever his sister shows up, uh, she kind of berates him and she shows that she's dominant over him. He's submissive to her. There's even kind of creepy sexual tension between them or something, some kind of incest uh, thing going on. It's unclear yet. So again, it's one of those uh, things that I don't know if they will do something with it later, which will be interesting or if it's just kind of filler, which is nonsense. And so it all depends what happens next. But it was another example of kind of a woman being more powerful than a man and also all these female admirals that keep uh, popping up, being in command. Uh, just like in Discovery, they had that uh, female admiral, I forgot her name. I think I called her uh, Admiral Kathleen Kennedy. And she was showing up every couple of episodes uh, for no reason. I kept uh, wondering what's the point of that character. She shows up and then she goes away and then she shows up again. And every time she shows up, she has to berate the male captain of the ship just to show that she's the one in charge. She's the one above him and she had to kind of humiliate the captain. And then she goes away until the next time that she again does that. And other than that, there was no point uh, to have her character at all in the show. She wasn't actually doing anything for the plot. You could cut out all her scenes and it wouldn't change anything. So that was one of those uh, things which felt like they're uh, pushing it into the show for no other reason other than to deliver that uh, message that women can be stronger than men. And of course they had the Klingon Chancellor who is a woman and they had the Emperor in the Mirror Universe who is a woman. And the women characters were much better and smarter than anyone else. And uh, individually each of those would, might have been fine but overall when you kind of notice it then it's kind of funny how much they're trying to push it. And so apparently they're doing the same kind of thing in this show. Uh, but to a lesser degree and also a lot of these are uh, villains and so I'm not sure it's really a message that they want to show that uh, if uh, the women are the villains then uh, okay they're powerful villains but uh, it's not really showing women to be better than men and so maybe they finally stopped with all of that, stopped pushing it too much. I'm all for equality by the way, I'm uh, all for doing it in an equal way for all uh, races and genders and uh, orientations, all of that I'm fine with all characters of all kinds. I just don't want it to be a reverse racism. I don't want only one specific group to now be on the bottom all the time, like they didn't discover it, because it's the reverse problem of what really used to exist. So enough of all of this topic, let me now go over the plot and some of the things which I liked and disliked. They start the episode with another flashback which kind of explains some of the things that uh, we heard about previously but not really, it's still kind of unclear and it's not exactly what I expected. I expected to see that Picard violated orders and went against orders and did something to save more Romulans against orders and yet uh, it didn't happen at all. Instead he simply resigned and went home. And then for some reason this Rafi character who was his first officer got fired by Starfleet because of that and it doesn't really make sense. And what makes even less sense is that later when he meets her she's super angry at him and it's only because of that, because Starfleet fired her. But how is that his fault? Why is she blaming him for something out of his control? And also that seems to be like the only reason why she's so messed up. Like when I first saw her and I saw that she's like a Sarah Connor type, I was uh, actually liking her. But then we find out the only reason was because she was fired from Starfleet and so I'm kind of thinking, wait, that's it? That's your whole backstory? That's what messed you up so much? Are you telling me you couldn't find anything else to do in this whole federation of planets? Without Starfleet you're nothing, without Starfleet you're a total loser, you're a total homeless woman who has to live in the desert and uh, I thought material needs no longer existed so are you telling me because you don't have a job in Starfleet that's why you have to live in this uh, trailer in the desert which looks like a lot of alien planets. I'll probably do a compilation of that on my other channel by the way check out my description for the link of my other channel so I will do that soon. So that didn't really make sense that she's complaining that Picard is rich and she's not and she has nothing but I thought material needs no longer exist. I thought people don't even have to work and they can live in a good apartment anywhere they want and so why are you stuck in the desert? I think a better reason would have been because of her paranoia because she doesn't want anyone to know where she is or something like that. Maybe there's some kind of a dampening field or a cloaking device hiding this whole area. Maybe that's why Picard couldn't simply beam there. That's why he had to take a taxi. And that's something I discussed in a previous video as well. I don't want to repeat everything. But uh, in short, I think uh, 
And I wish they would have explained a little stuff like that because a lot of people kind of uh, use that uh, to bash the show. They say this doesn't make sense, that doesn't make sense. But if they simply had like one small line to explain it, then it would be fine. So for example, maybe he used a taxi to get there so that he cannot be tracked by a Starfleet because he now suspects villains in Starfleet and all of that. So that's fine. That's a perfect excuse for why he doesn't want to use the official transporter system and instead he takes uh, maybe an, an unlicensed taxi that is uh, untraceable or something so that could be a good explanation for why he came in a shuttle also i liked uh, that they addressed some of the things that didn't make sense in the previous episode for example i said uh, it doesn't make sense why would the tal shiar sabotage the mars shipyards which were building a fleet which was supposed to save romulans so why did they basically screwed up their own people just to get rid of the androids which they could have done after that rescue so it makes no sense and at least they addressed it they never explained it yet but at least they addressed this problem so that means the writers are aware of the logic of that and maybe the explanation is uh, simply because uh, the Tal Shiar or that other organization inside it maybe that's why they did it because they knew they will never suspect it was us because it's against our own interest and so no one will suspect it was us and that's why we did it and we don't care to sacrifice billions of our own people just to get that done because uh, getting rid of AI is much more important to us than saving a billion of our own people. I guess that might be the explanation. Hopefully there will be something more logical or maybe someone else did that and not them. But at least uh, it seems that the show is aware of its own uh, illogic for now. And that's why I think it will be explained later. Another thing I remember complaining about why is Picard looking for a pilot if he is a pilot himself, but uh, this episode made it clear he simply needs a ship which Starfleet cannot follow and that's why he needs a pilot with a ship and so that kind of makes sense now so I redraw my complaint about that specific point and we have a bunch of scenes in the Borg cube and it's funny when they show the Borg cube at first they kind of uh, fly into it and the camera flies into the Borg cube and shows us uh, the giant structure and all of that and that kind of reminds me of all those shots in Discovery of the inside of the ship looking like a, a huge maze and all of that and I remember complaining about that but uh, you know I never had a problem with showing that kind of stuff in general I only had a problem with it in Discovery because it was a prequel and it made no sense why ships in the past were so much bigger and had such uh, giant spaces, uh, empty spaces inside the ship it simply didn't fit the time period but I remember saying if it was uh, in the far future maybe Starfleet ships became much bigger or if it's an alien ship which is much bigger then it would be totally fine I actually like that kind of stuff I remember I even made a video comparing Star Wars to Star Trek and I said that was one of the things I prefer in Star Wars because they always show starships which are huge both inside and outside and I always loved uh, in the old Star Trek shows whenever they did show us uh, stuff like that for example with the Borg cube I always loved it I loved seeing the size of it from inside and the only real reason I disliked it in Discovery was because it's all in the past and the, the ships are not supposed to be that big and to look like that from inside and so that's why it was annoying and so here they finally show us something like that inside the Borg cube and so when that uh, special effect sequence began I was kind of uh, happy I knew that uh, oh now they can do it uh, whatever they want now I will not uh, complain now they can go uh, all out with all these kinds of special effects and I would love it because it actually fits the place they're showing. But then it uh, wasn't really that impressive, it was kind of lame. So they did kind of show the camera flying through some uh, structures, but then it kind of ends briefly and I think it was less impressive than all those internal shots of Discovery. So it didn't even look as big as that and not as impressive as that and so I thought uh, that was a huge missed opportunity because finally they could have done it and they made it awesome and yet they made it kind of lame and cheap and lazy if they inserted the discovery scenes here it would have fit much better to a Borg cube the inside of a Borg cube should be huge because you know they have to have empty spaces to maybe create more levels later to have more uh, Borg drones and maybe they need the uh, space to pull in uh, chunks of uh, the ships they assimilate to break them down into raw materials and so they need all that empty space inside for their future assimilation and the expansion and all of that so this was an opportunity to show it in an awesome way and it was kind of lame and not even as impressive as the discovery internal shots and so that's kind of a missed opportunity and we finally see Hugh who was a Borg drone that was liberated during TNG in the episode I Borg and it was actually great seeing him and he is very recognizable still and uh, they did his makeup pretty well, all the details were uh, in the right places and so I have no complaints about how he looked like. 
It's kind of too early to judge him as a character because he didn't really do anything or say anything that interesting about himself. So it's too early to judge the character, but uh, his looks are uh, spot on. And his character kind of fits the plot because he was one of the very first uh, liberated drones before Seven of Nine. And so he, it, uh, it's perfect to have him in this kind of role of liberating other Borg drones. And speaking of which, they showed us what happens to some of the liberated drones and uh, some of them become kind of crazy and uh, they show us a room uh, filled with uh, crazy ex-Borg uh, drones uh, Romulans who are kind of like in a mental institute and I kind of liked all of that I always loved movies about uh, crazy people mental asylums and all of that uh, I have uh, a weak spot for that and one of my favorite TNG episodes is Frame of Mind in which Riker was inside a mental asylum and so it was very similar to that in a good way and they also seem to be setting up all kinds of mysteries involving that uh, android uh, woman and uh, they showed us that crazy Romulan woman who kind of sees the future or something and she it kind of reminds me of some of the scenes they did in Discovery when Spock was in a mental asylum and he was behaving crazy and uh, saying cryptic stuff like uh, why do I remember tomorrow and this uh, Romulan woman also says stuff like that she says to her uh, I remember meeting you tomorrow or something like that so it was very similar to some of the dialogue in Discovery and there are other similarities in dialogue uh, it's obviously written by some of the same uh, writers I didn't look up who wrote what but uh, it's very similar there was also that scene of a uh, spork that Romulan guy whispering into her ear that he's in love with her and that reminds me of a scene uh, with Michael in uh, season one of Discovery in which she also whispered into someone's ear that she never been in love or something like that so there are all kinds of little similarities to Discovery and even uh, the way everything looks you know spork looks kind of like Spock in Discovery that's why I call him spork so anyway, I kind of like some of the scenes with the crazy Romulan woman and they are kind of setting up things which I hope will be done later. For example, she has kind of uh, cards with uh, pictures and then on one of them there is a, a picture of a twin, two twin uh, women. And so it's obviously parallel to the android twins. And then she asks her, are you the one who died or are you the one who lived? And she's the, like uh, scared of her and she then says she will be the destroyer and stuff. And so... That kind of, uh, I kind of like that and I'm uh, thinking they will probably do kind of a double twist. Maybe later on it will be revealed that Dalj didn't actually die. We did see her being hit by acid and by an explosion, but we didn't actually see her dead body. So maybe someone took her, maybe she was able to recover from that because she's an advanced android. And maybe she will be the villain later and so they might be doing kind of a double twist. So maybe the other one will be the evil one later or vice versa and so anything might happen and so this might be interesting later. What I didn't like about the scene with the mental patients is the way they edited it. They basically spread it out across the whole episode and split it into multiple parts with other things happening in between. And the problem with that is that in the beginning they said the meeting will last uh, 30 minutes. And yet it was spread over the whole episode with a whole bunch of stuff happening in between. And so it made it look like that other scene was taking place uh, during days, not uh, 30 minutes. And so that's something I disliked in the editing. They did the similar blunder in the previous episode when they split two scenes together, even though it was not chronological and it made it unnecessarily confusing. And so it messed up the episode in the previous one. And here they kind of split off this scene, which should have been one scene. But they spread it out across the whole episode with multiple other scenes in between. And so that created the kind of uh, unnecessary uh, dragging of it. I think it would have worked much better if simply as a one scene that we see from beginning to end. I think the only reason they did that because they wanted to have that parallel with that Romulan who was saying similar stuff. Other similarities to Discovery, all the visual stuff which I always complain about, I don't want to repeat myself, but all the stuff with the lens flares, uh, the new ship designs, all of that is kind of ugly in my opinion. I don't like that even when I saw the trailers for the show, I said the worst part of the trailers were all the parts that remind me of Star Trek Discovery, all those new designs, all those lens flares, holograms everywhere, all that kind of stuff. But at least now it's all in the future, at least now it doesn't violate continuity because, uh, you know, holograms existing, that's fine. Even those holographic controls actually fit something that uh, Bashir said in the episode The Visitor, which was taking place decades in the future. And he said that he doesn't know how they used to operate only two-dimensional panels. And so that actually fits what we see now with uh, holograms being used to pilot the ships and stuff like that. 
and uh, the new ship that they got, uh, first of all, it doesn't violate anything because uh, it's not a Starfleet ship, I think, and so it's totally okay for it to be totally different. The design from outside seems more like a Jem'Hadar ship than any kind of Federation ship, but again, it's too early to say if I like or dislike it. The things that really annoy me are all kinds of uh, scientifically stupid stuff. For example, they had a shot uh, when that uh, new pilot guy looks out of the window and he's in space, he's in orbit, and then he sees a shooting star in the sky. He sees a falling star, and uh, we had stuff like that in Discovery also, and in the short treks we saw people looking out the window in space and seeing falling stars, and I always complained about shots like that because it makes no sense, because uh, you would only see that inside an atmosphere, and so when I saw that I kind of uh, got pissed off, but then I told myself, you know, maybe it's not really a falling star, maybe it's simply a different ship uh, going into warp or something like that, but then they showed us a scene in the vineyard, and then we see Picard looking at the sky, and he sees the same exact falling star that the guy on the ship saw, and so that's obviously a shooting star and not a ship going into warp, and so that kind of annoyed me, the same way it annoyed me in Discovery, seeing stupid stuff like that. And then uh, begins the scene which I think I will complain the most about, when uh, the Romulan agents suddenly attack the vineyard and they try to kill Picard, I guess, and luckily those two Romulan guys who live with him kick their ass and manage to save Picard. Now, why does this scene annoy me? You know, a lot of people complained in the first episode about that scene of those Romulans attacking the android uh, girl and they were constantly beaming in, beaming out, beaming in, beaming out and so the question arises why didn't they simply beam her to their secret location or out into space or why don't they beam a bomb down there? What was the reason for them to personally beam down and try to fight her but not uh, beam her away or to kill her with a bomb or something? So it made no sense. And I remember trying very hard to come up with excuses and explanations to explain it away doing the job of the writers and I said maybe she has some kind of internal defense mechanism that prevents anyone transporting her against her will. So that's why they couldn't simply take her away and um, I also said that they were not trying to kill her, they were trying to kidnap her to get some information out of her and that's why they were not uh, using lethal weapons, uh, that's why they didn't simply use the bomb to get her. And yet now, it's revealed in this episode, they say that uh, Romulan weapons don't have a stun setting, they're only meant to kill, and so that means uh, all those times in which they were shooting at her, they were uh, not trying to capture her. And so that begs the question, why didn't they simply beam a bomb down there to get her? And by the way, about the stun setting thing, I think it's not uh, a mistake, because all the times we saw Romulan shooting someone, it was always meant to kill or to vaporize, so I don't think it's a continuity mistake, it kind of fits everything we saw in the other shows, but it still doesn't really make much sense, because wouldn't the Romulans want to take prisoners to interrogate them, isn't that important? So why wouldn't there be a stun setting? And also I think there was an episode in which a Romulan shot uh, Ro Laren in the leg, and later on she was walking fine on that leg, and so there was no permanent injury, so that seems to indicate it was kind of a stun setting and not uh, meant to kill, it was I think in that episode the next phase, so maybe because they were out of phase it was working differently, I guess I can come up with an excuse, but uh, most times we did see Romulan uh, weapons always killing people and not stunning them, so I don't, I can't complain about this uh, line, but I can complain about the fact that uh, that means those Romulans were trying to kill Dodge in the first episode, why didn't they simply send a, a bomb uh, to her location, or multiple bombs and get her that way? if they were not trying to capture her, and why didn't they beam her away? So one excuse I made myself is that she had some kind of a protective techno bubble excuse for that, and yet here in this episode they cannot do it with these characters either, and so now it's really stupid, now I can't explain it away, because if they are trying to get Picard, why cannot they beam him out of that house, instead of trying to beam in, and also not even in into the house, they beam outside of the house, and then go in. Why not uh, beam directly in and to catch them by surprise, or to beam a bomb into it and simply blow up the house, or simply beam everybody out into space or something, so it makes no sense for them to be so stupid, basically, so that's why this scene kind of annoys me. And also their helmets seem to be totally useless, because the Tromlan guy hits one of them with a bottle and he falls down, so <laughs> the helmet didn't protect his head from a little glass bottle. So all of that scene uh, was a bit ridiculous. Now if they explain it away with a simple line, if they said something like, oh it's such a good thing we set up a transport inhibitor in the room, otherwise they would have uh, simply beamed us out, and so that's why they had to go in, 
and that would also explain why they set up all the traps, all the phasers under the table and all of that if they were actually anticipating an attack and so that would make sense they could simply say they set up something that prevents anyone beaming in uninvited or to beam them out and that's why they had to go in from outside the house and then it would be totally fine another thing that doesn't make sense uh, after they killed all those romulans they have a pile of romulan bodies so why cannot they now go to starfleet or to other earth authorities and to simply show them those bodies as proof that's a direct proof that there are romulan agents operating on earth uh, trying to kill Picard so isn't this proof enough that you have uh, multiple bodies now you can say maybe Picard knows that Starfleet is corrupt and being secretly infiltrated by those uh, agents and so you cannot trust Starfleet fine why don't you then call in the Federation News Service uh, FNN and show them those bodies and then it will be all over the news and then uh, the authorities the other authorities cannot ignore it if it's all over the news that there are uh, Romulan assassins trying to take out Picard then there will have to be a major investigation by Starfleet and it cannot simply be put under the rug, it cannot simply be classified it's, uh, if it's all over the news. So that's the first uh, thing Picard should have done, is call that black lady from FNN and show her all those Romulan bodies and tell her everything he knows and then it will be all over the news and then no one can uh, make it classified, no one can uh, make it disappear and no one can uh, take out Picard, he will be under protection. You know, the president of the Federation can get involved to do a full investigation, including of Starfleet itself, and to find out whoever is responsible. That's what Picard should have done if he wasn't uh, suffering from Eromodic Syndrome, I guess, because it makes no sense for him to keep it to himself. Oh, I have a bunch of dead Romulan bodies, uh, but I will never show it to anyone. So what did he do with all those bodies? Did they burn them or what? The one uh, who was alive conveniently killed himself with that same acid, and so they have no living witness to interrogate anymore and that was also very stupid because Picard himself saw the Romulan spitting acid in the first episode so he knew that they have some kind of capsule or something in their mouth and they can commit suicide or even kill someone else in this way and yet he doesn't do anything to prevent it in this episode so he saw that in episode 1 he knew it's a possibility and yet before they wake up this Romulan they never bother to check his mouth to take out that capsule and uh, he could have killed one of them with this and so it was extremely stupid that Picard uh, didn't do anything to prevent that and that they kept all of this secret apparently so what did they do with all those bodies and why didn't they report it to anyone on earth and so that's kind of stupid as well if all the bodies got destroyed somehow by Asi then we could at least say okay there is no proof anymore but here they have the bodies what I did like is how they explain away the Romulan forehead and it's something I discussed previously there was a whole bunch of contradictions because in TNG the Romulans had uh, big foreheads but in TOS they did not, they looked like Vulcans and later in the JJ movies they kind of made them with uh, a small forehead not uh, the TNG one but a slightly more bulky one than uh, the Vulcan human looking forehead and so there was a whole bunch of contradictions with the Romulan look and here they kind of explained it by saying that uh, this Romulan with the big forehead is uh, from the north of Romulus or something like that and so the northern uh, Romulans look different to the southern uh, Romulans or something and so at least it explains away that contradiction with the foreheads and also she used the opportunity to poke fun at that other Romulan saying that uh, he's a northern like you, he's stupid like you so another insult from a woman against a man, even though I did kind of like this scene simply because they were funny whenever she berates him it's kind of funny in a way because it's like a real married couple, you know, uh, women always kind of insulting the men and all of that so it's not uh, unrealistic you could say, and so that's why I don't, I don't really mind this one it is kind of a problem what I talked about of uh, it being done all the time in these new shows women always humiliating all the men and they do something similar with uh, Spork's evil sister because whenever she shows up she always has to dominate him, she has to humiliate him and I really don't get it, it feels like some sort of a fetish like whoever wrote this episode maybe had a brother who she hated and she just takes it out on this character so it's really strange and also there's kind of a sexual tension between them like the way they're talking to each other in a sensual way they're kind of whispering into each other's ears again just like before as I mentioned so they're whispering into their ears and they're kind of touching with the nose on the cheek and there's kind of a, a tension going on and it's incest because they're a brother and sister so what the hell is all of that about I have no idea and the stupidest moment in the whole episode when uh, Commander O showed up to meet uh, the scientist lady and she wears uh, sunglasses which look like today so just normal looking sunglasses on a Vulcan 
and she also has unusually big ears and they seem to be pointing forward and so it's like a Yoda look and not a Vulcan so what the hell is wrong and the sunglasses just make all of it look ridiculous it's like something out of an outtake or a blooper or a joke video or a meme it doesn't really, I was almost laughing seeing that in the actual episode I was like what the hell is that since when are people wearing sunglasses in uh, Star Trek and why are they doing that? Do they try to make her look like a secret agent? That's why she has to have sunglasses and I would have no problem if they looked kind of futuristic. At least it would be interesting and not so stupid looking if she was wearing kind of a visor or something, you know, sort of like what uh, Doc Brown was wearing in Back to the Future 2 when he came back from the future and he was wearing a futuristic clothing and uh, those strange uh, sunglasses and at least that looked kind of futuristic and cool and interesting and yet here she just wears the uh, sunglasses of today and it's also a continuity mistake because uh, it was actually mentioned specifically that Vulcans don't need sunglasses because they evolved on a planet which is a desert planet and they're used uh, to a much uh, brighter light and all of that so they don't need sunglasses. It was mentioned specifically in the episode The Forge when they went to the Vulcan desert and then Archer tried to give sunglasses to Tapol, but then she refused and she said, my inner eyelids will protect my vision. My species evolved on this planet. So that indicates that uh, they have no need for sunglasses, even on Vulcan itself. And so if you have a Vulcan who is on Earth, why would the Vulcan want to wear sunglasses? Now you can go technical and say, oh, but she's not really a Vulcan, she's a Romulan. Maybe she grew up on Remus, in the dark side of Remus or something. You can uh, come up with excuses. But again, why are we having to do that? Why the episode itself? Why do the writers put these kinds of stupid stuff into the episode? Which we later have to explain away with excuses. And so that's still annoying. That's still stupid. And especially because those were uh, modern looking sunglasses. And so what's even the point of that? It simply took me out of it. It simply was uh, ridiculous. So all of this is kind of laughable. It's like they, were, they wanted to make her look cooler. They wanted, they said, oh, you're a secret agent. So that means you should wear uh, sunglasses. That's how it, it's done in all the movies. So we don't care that it's Star Trek. We don't care that Vulcans are not sensitive to light. Or maybe she's from the mirror universe or something. So it makes no sense. Why is she so sensitive to light that she has to wear sunglasses? Maybe it's because of all the lens flares in the show. There are so many lens flares that she has to wear sunglasses to be able to tolerate it. I guess that's an excuse. There was also a scene on the Borg cube in which uh, the second Dodge uh, contacts her mother and it's once again that same hologram in that stupid looking communicator which kind of uh, puts a face of the person but without showing where the person is and so it's like a screen but only showing the face and it looks kind of creepy and kind of funny in a bad way like I wouldn't want to see someone's face like that in a 3D it's much better to simply see a screen and not have the face come out at me from inside the screen, so that looks kind of creepy. And I'm guessing that uh, mother is fake, she's not a real person, because they said uh, they had uh, artificial memories of their childhood, so I'm guessing that mother never really existed, she's only in their memories, or she's a hologram, but not a real person, and she tries to contact her. So I'm wondering where is that transmission coming from? Who is sending that hologram of their mother all the time? It wasn't yet explained. And then uh, for some reason uh, Dodge 2 suddenly faints and then Spork suddenly enters her room. And remember they said they're going to keep their uh, relationship a secret and all of that. And yet when the door opens, you can see a whole bunch of people walking outside of it. And so how exactly can you keep it a secret when so many people see you going in and out of the room all the time? So that's also kind of a ridiculous moment. And then he whispers in her ear that he's in love with her and all of that. And also I don't really like her character either, like uh, she's supposed to be, they're trying so hard to make her look like such an empathic person who just wants to help everybody and she's so uh, lovely in her personality, she has so much empathy and all of that, but it's really kind of um, forced and artificial and not really interesting the way she tries to, it basically reminds me of Counselor Troy in the early seasons of TNG who was always so uh, empathic and always tries to help uh, people emotionally and all that kind of stuff. So I'm not sure where they're even going with it. So again, it's one of those uh, things that uh, I guess we'll wait and see before we judge it. So the episode ends uh, with Picard on this new ship with this uh, cool pilot and uh, Sarah Connor and the scientist lady and the EMH, I guess. And uh, he says engage uh, to the camera and all of that. And then they jump to warp inside the solar system right next to earth and they jump to warp right away 
So doesn't that violate like a whole bunch of rules? But I guess that guy doesn't care about that. Maybe his ship kind of is camouflaged or something because, uh, you know, they said his ship is uh, unregistered, unlicensed, it's a secret ship, and yet they are uh, right next to Earth. And so wouldn't someone detect it or something? Maybe he has uh, all kinds of super duper camouflage technology and no one can see him, I guess. Uh, that's the only explanation, which again, I wish they would have said something about it. Then it would make sense at least. And then they jump to warp right uh, next to Earth which is a violation of a, a lot of rules, I'm sure, because it was sometimes said it's not allowed. But maybe it depends on the solar alignment or whatever, maybe sometimes it's okay, it depends. And you know that moment of Picard saying engage, and uh, that uh, music that was playing uh, sounded kind of Star Trek-ish, that almost made me emotional for a moment, but then we see a whole bunch of lens flares all over the ship, and the warp uh, flash itself is like a giant lens flare and all of that, so that kind of reminds me, oh no, this is a... Uh, not really Star Trek, this is STD Star Trek. And we also saw glimpses of the next episode in which we'll finally get to meet uh, Space Legolas. And you know, I always uh, thought that was just a coincidence that he looks so much like Legolas and all of that. But I think they did it deliberately because we get to see glimpses of his planet and it looks a lot like the elf city in Lord of the Rings. The same kind of uh, designs, the same kind of... Uh, vegetation around there and so I'm pretty sure it's a deliberate, it's basically a ripoff of elements from Lord of the Rings and it's been done deliberately and maybe it even explains why they changed the makeup of some of the Romulans to look much more like the elves with much bigger ears pointing much more uh, to the sides and not like the older uh, Romulans from TNG and so this might explain it. It was all because they wanted all of it to look more like the elves in Lord of the Rings because they wanted the Space Legolas guy and they will even show that his home is uh, like uh, the one in Lord of the Rings. And so that's kind of funny, I guess. But it's another example of the show kind of borrowing ideas and imagery from other places which were popular. And so instead of making up something new and original, they're kind of imitating other things which were good. Just like they imitated Blade Runner in some of the visual stuff and some of the story plots. And just like they're imitating a whole bunch of characters with this new pilot guy who is kind of like, you know, Han Solo. Kind of like... Uh, that guy from uh, Alien 4 who was also kind of smoking and drinking and he was a tough guy, the, the leader of the ship and a whole bunch of characters like that from uh, a lot of other TV shows but you know, if they're uh, ripping off good stuff then maybe this will also be good, uh, hopefully and so maybe at least we'll have some enjoyment from it but uh, I still wish they would have some originality and it still doesn't really feel like Star Trek Star Trek should be about exploring new things, new civilizations, all of that and for now it's simply recycling stuff and stealing stuff from other movies and uh, I still didn't see anything really original, but I guess we'll wait and see if they will do a few quests, a few episodes in which they will uh, encounter some brand new things and some new science fiction ideas, then maybe all of it will be worth it. So it remains to be seen. So the episode ends with uh, giant lens flares all over the screen, and you know, even the internal shots of that ship has uh, all kinds of lamps and stuff, and it's creating lens flares inside the ship. And uh, it kind of made me laugh in that part when Picard beams into the ship and uh, right behind him there are all those lights and I was kind of thinking in my head that uh, maybe Picard should kind of look at those lights and suddenly scream at them There are four lights! That would have been funny maybe, maybe I'll do an edit like that. And you know maybe that's how I will uh, rank these episodes from now on. Maybe I will not do it uh, 1 to 10, I will do it 1 to 5 and I will uh, say how many lights the episode has. It will be the five light system. Five lights means it's excellent. One light means it's terrible. So that's how I will uh, rank the episodes from now on. And I will scream it like Picard. And I think uh, the first episode had uh, four lights. The second episode had uh, one light. And this episode has three lights. This is all of course my opinion. If you want to share your opinion, you are welcome to do that in the comment section. And we can continue the discussion in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you all next time. Bye bye.